Hello and welcome everyone to episode 49, where today we're reviewing the game and watch, new widescreen game called, Super Mario Bros. This was Nintendo's 55th game and watch since they released the original game called Ball, way back in 1980. With this game being initially offered for sale March 8, 1988, and selling an impressive 1 million copies. And it was given the production code of YM105. And came with an instruction booklet that was more like a real book, having 25 pages of content. The booklet starts out with the usual preamble, such as the information on battery maintenance, and details of how to set both the time and alarm function, as well as the overview on the how to play section. However, things change quickly, we have, for the first time in an instruction booklet a cast list of characters that'll appear in the gameplay, as well as a parchment message scribed by Princess Toadstool herself, seeking Mario's help and assistance. There are 8 levels, or worlds in this game, and each rotation, which is called a loop, sees different obstacles appear, and there is a total of 9 loops in all. Each loop progressively becomes harder and harder, with added dangers and greater challenges, that makes this game quite unique. The first world is called Canyon, and the second is called Simply Gym. The third is known as Burning Room, that shows flaming logs rotating, that sadly have to be imagined during gameplay as they appear as identical to the platforms. As we arrive at the fourth world, called Channel, we see it set as an underwater challenge, but once again, you'll need to imagine Mario swimming as the additional sprites showing him diving are sadly lacking. The fifth world is called Hop. World or level 6 is another unusual timed event, this level is called Beam, and it is very much unlike the next level, or next world, world number 7, which is called Maze, and is designed much more like the traditional distance challenge and side-scroller style that Super Mario Bros. is actually known for. At the end of world 7, there are three pipes, you have to choose one and press down on the directional control. One will end that round, but the other two will take you back to the beginning of world 7. And finally, World 8, called Burning Road, is most like the original NES version of Super Mario Bros. on this game. The instructions booklet finishes up with the control buttons and their functions, surprisingly using four separate buttons over the previously used iconic cross, or plus symbol-shaped D-pad. With point scoring, how to achieve extra lives, the confirmation of the nine loops, or rotations through the eight available worlds or levels is rounded off by illustrating how lives are lost, which is referred to as misses in the booklet. A section on how to achieve the bonus scoring, in the various timed events mentioned previously is explained, as is a very short and pithy, helpful hints and tips summary that would likely assist a novice player on this game. The instruction booklet finishes up in the normal fashion, by covering maintenance and care, as well as the usual cautions and warnings that typify Nintendo's game and watch series. I've decided to include a short review of each world, however I have restricted the loops to primarily the first loop only, as 9 loops through he 8 worlds would be too time consuming. As we join the play here we can see we've just got a mushroom, for an extra 8 points and better still, an additional life. Looking at the extract from the instructions booklet, we can confirm the world we're watching is World 1, called Canyon, and we're doing loop 1 of 9 through the first set of 8 worlds. Also notice the distance counter is down to 0, so Princess Toadstool will appear soon. On completion of World 1, called Canyon, we receive 111 points, with 4 lives remaining. Now onto World 2, we're hitting the gym. In this world we leap and vault, skip and jump over various obstacles in a distance event, until the counter gets down to zero and then once again we meet up with Princess Toadstool. During loop 1, there is very little in the way of obstacles, no thrown hammers from Lakitu, no bullet bills so early in the game, just the basics of being crushed by walls, or perhaps even more likely, falling into the water at the bottom of the screen. So at the end of World 2, called Jim, we once again meet Princess Toadstool and receive our rewards, for a grand total of 181 points. World 3 is a timed event, and in Loop 1, you might blink it and miss the entire world, which is called Burning Room. So with a total of 191 points, and 4 lives we move on to the next world, World 4 called interestingly, Channel, which is set underwater. This is another distance event, but does not require the use of the jump button, merely the directional controls to navigate through the watery channel. And once again we watch as the distance meter goes down to zero, indicating that Princess Toadstool will be arriving shortly. Then, when the last few platforms are circumvented, the beautiful princess appears, to finish off this world with a respectable 261 points, as well as a healthy 4 lives left. As we forge forward to the next world, World 5, we see it's called Simply Hop. And once again, similar to previous levels, we see it as a distance event, this time with platforms and barricades that Mario must hop over while we scroll right towards the princess. 
After the zero marker is passed, it just takes a few seconds more to meet up with this level's Princess Toadstool. And while maintaining the maximum 4 lives, we finish this world with a respectable 331 point total. World 6 is called Beam, and is another timed event, however, we just lost a life, Mario fell into the water, and has to restart the level. So after what can only be called an unfortunate start, we complete this world, and we still have a respectable 3 lives remaining, we finish up with a grand total of 341 points. World 7 is up next, and it's called Maze, it's also back to being a distance event or level, but this time with a tricky end, that doesn't include Princess Toadstool. After the course is successfully completed, you'll be presented with three pipes, again, use imagination here, you'll need to choose one. It may lead you to the next and final world, world 8, or if you're unlucky, it'll make you restart level 7 again. To compound the danger, only one of the three pipes allows you to continue. Good luck! And we guessed right, we made it to the final world, world 8, called Burning Road. Which is as I mentioned in the earlier segment, the most NES-like gameplay of all the worlds on this game and watch. It is a distance level world, and actually requires every element of control to navigate safely through the most complex platform map to date. With the distance counter reading 0, we're going to meet Princess Toadstool very soon, this will then wrap up the first loop of 9 possible loops, and our first rotation through all available 8 worlds. We complete the first loop with 714 points, we see Mario being swooned over by Princess Toadstool, with her heart a-fluttering, and an image of Bowser's castle together with an upside-down Bowser being tossed out as a fanfare place. Loop 2 of 9 would be next, with World 1, Canyon, however this time you'll see the hazards have ramped up as Bullet Bill is in play. Mrs. R, however more often accrued by poor old Mario simply falling into the water and losing a life. The character known as Lakitu, is seen perched on top of a cloud, and is really just a Koopa henchman, his attack is to throw hammers at poor old Mario, he becomes more prevalent in the gameplay as we complete the later 9 loops. Also, during the later gameplay, stars and mushrooms appear far more frequently, these give not only extra points, but also an additional life, up to a maximum of 4 in total. Well, as we're nearing the end of our fact-based review, let's look at other issues and reissues of this particular game. Previously Nintendo issued the same game on the Crystal Screen series in June of 1986. And then a year later, Nintendo issued the game and watched Super Mario Bros. as a prize in a competition. The 1987 prize version was presented in a special case, based on the Famicom disc operating system. A full decade later, in 1998 Nintendo authorized the production and sale of the Mini Classic series, which were fully playable versions of today's game, but in a compact keychain case. Surprisingly they must have been popular, as they have spawned a bootleg version that continues to be offered for sale. Another surprise, might be that Nintendo failed to include a version of today's game on the identically named, Super Mario Bros. Game & Watch, color screen version issued in 2020. And what was, perhaps also interesting, was that with the exception of the horrible fakes or bootleg cheap copies, that we've just seen, all of the mini classic versions, those keychain ones, all used a traditional directional control pad that resembled the plus sign, or a cross. However, the reappearance of four separate buttons, that form the directional control buttons on today's focus and star of our show, has once again been revisited, in the mighty Nintendo Switch, which I think is just awesome. So let's wrap up this episode with a montage of photos of today's VIP, and admire the game and watch, new widescreen, 1988 beauty, Super Mario Bros. Well, that's just about it folks, we're done here for today's show. Hopefully you didn't mind the extra length of today's episode, I really struggled to keep it as short as I possibly could, but it was such a complex game and watch, and I really wanted to do it the justice it deserved, I hope you all understand. Well, the normal YouTube plea, I'd ask ever so kindly that you take the next few seconds to like our show, please feel free to subscribe and even follow us, but mostly, thank you so much for joining us here today.